So we have some very, uh, the next three uh, speakers are the uh, gentlemen that are up here. Very distinguished speakers uh, with incredible backgrounds. I'll let them identify themselves and their backgrounds. But for cannabis science, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Wynn. Uh, he is a medical doctor and also has an MBA. Let's welcome Dr. David Wynn. and all your officers for being here today as well. Um, so as the mayor mentioned, my name is Dr. David Wynn, and I'm very honored to be here today to talk to you about the science behind cannabis in humans. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Shu, will be following up with uh, the cannabis use and the science in pets and other vertebrates, but uh, my talk will focus a bit on how it affects us. So this is You'll have to forgive me, first of all. This presentation may not be as polished as some of the other speakers because this was a talk that I gave for another event a few years ago, and there's a lot of relevance here today for what we're discussing, too, so just, just bear with me. Um, we'll start with a bit on who I am, but before we get to that, uh, in my line of work, before a presentation usually starts, we discuss our financial disclosures because some of our discussions and presentations are sponsored by different pharmaceutical companies, and it's only fair to you as the audience members to know uh, if I am being sponsored by anyone. And the answer is no. I am getting no money to be here today. I actually live down in Orange County, so I'm, I'm not a resident of your great town. In fact, I took a bit of a drive to come up here today. I closed my practice down today. Uh, normally I'd be working, so I'm actually losing a bit of opportunities to be here with you today. But that's okay, this is a passion of mine, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here to, to share this knowledge with you. Um, so that being said, um, let's find out a bit about who I am. So that was me, I guess I put some pictures of me when I was here. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I went to undergrad not too far from here at Cal State LA, and then I went to medical school uh, at the University of Iowa. Uh, so a US medical school graduate. And I did my residency training at UC Irvine. Uh, I am an anesthesiologist by training. So, as the mayor mentioned in his introduction, um, or maybe it was one of our discussions in the back there, uh, about fentanyl. And I think fentanyl is getting a lot of press these days because it's one of the driving factors in the opioid crisis that we as Americans are suffering from. And as a an an practicing anesthesiologist, I can tell you, I have given lots of fentanyl to my patients. In fact, if anyone sitting in the audience here today has gone through a surgery of some kind, chances are you have also received fentanyl. Fentanyl in the right hands, used in the right way, is an amazing drug. It's an amazing painkiller, and it gets people safely through surgeries and different procedures. But obviously, like with anything, if it's, mis if it's abused and misused, it leads to very, very tragic consequences. So. Uh, well, the, the, after or during my time as an anesthesiologist, I also uh, worked in the chronic pain clinics, and these are the clinics where the patients who have sadly become dependent on opioids, that's where they got a lot of their care. You know, back in the 90s, the early 90s, when opioids were first hitting the market, it was, you know, being, told to us physicians that it was the, you know, the next big medicine, the next big tool that we had in our arsenal to deal with chronic pain patients. But of course, nowadays, we see how wrong the pharmaceutical companies were in that marketing campaign. Um, and so by the time I got to my training and my practice, um, opioids were starting to be seen as something that was not a viable long-term solution. But given its history, a lot of people were already on it, but we were slowly transitioning off to other other medications. But it was still, and from my own personal experience, I saw these patients, I saw what they were going through. If you've ever been to a chronic pain clinic, there are no happy customers. Um, you know, even if you leave, the patient leaves with a refill on his or her opioids, it, it, they're not happy. You know, it's just something they take. There are plenty of side effects that we can discuss later, uh, but it's not something that they're happy to take. And so. Um, I saw this, and that is one of my one of the impetus that I had to look into alternative therapies for chronic pain. 
which eventually led me to find cannabis and eventually led me to this company that I um, work with called Presto Doctor, where we provide online medical consultations to patients throughout the state of California and to evaluate and see if they are patients that could benefit from medical cannabis. So I joined in August of 2015. This is just a bit of spiel about what the company is, what they do. Um, I have a very big majority of patients who are veterans of the armed forces and it's actually a very proud thing for me to say that I've offered a lot of, you know, bon pro bono work to support these veterans who have come home from overseas, dealing with issues like both physical chronic pain from the work that they did on our behalf, as well as what I call mental pain from the experiences, many of them traumatic, and how it affects them transitioning back to civilian life. They are not sleeping at night, they are having nightmares, they are not having a good quality of life. They are given a plethora of pharmaceutical medications from their VA doctors, and again, they're not happy about that. So, um, and, and, and a lot of my patients are older patients who have not used cannabis since, since they were in, their 60s, in the 1960s and 70s. So um, we've already expanded into Nevada. Uh, this is the, the disclosures that I was telling you about earlier. I think it's especially relevant, like I said here today, with our discussion as well. So now we're going to go into the actual science behind how the uh, cannabis system or the endocannabinoid system in our bodies works. Uh, also, what happens when we ingest it versus inhaling it. If we have time, we'll talk about how it's metabolized and the interactions it has, as well as how it affects pregnant women and, and, and uh, lactation afterwards. So this is a topic that when I was in medical school, we were not taught. And it's a real travesty, I feel, because the endocannabinoid system is, it is, is, is real. It's as real as the cardiovascular system that pumps your blood. It's as real as your pulmonary system that helps you breathe. It's as real as your endocrine system that you know, provides insulin for you after you eat a meal. So the endocannabinoid system is a real, part of your body, and it's, an, it's a part of all vertebrates, not just humans, as Dr. Shu uh, can discuss on his topic, but this is a real part of your body, and it's one job is to maintain homeostasis, which is uh, the technical term for maintaining balance in your body. Too much inflammation in a lot of diseases is an imbalance. Um, too much oxidative stress after you know cellular stress is an imbalance. So the only job of the endocannabinoid system is to make sure that your body is where it's supposed to be. Uh, it, it's not new, and that, that is what I feel is the saddest part. You know, this the system was discovered in 1993. Uh, PubMed is a very popular um, research portal that folks in the industry use for the latest research. Uh, information, it's, it's listed in many, many results. As you can tell, back in 1993, there were only 10, but you know, just uh, five years ago, it jumped up to 6,000. So there is a lot of work that is being done in researching this, um, this system. And I can tell you, on top of that, you know, nowadays, with the passage of the, the new legislation, the less people are getting their medical cards. Um, and, and that's fine, you know, it's, 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 it's just it's something I do from, as of my passion. But my regular job these days, I actually have left clinical practice, and now I work for a contract research organization that does early phase clinical trials for pharmaceutical companies. So I know it's kind of why doctors say the pharmaceutical companies put out those opioids, which are so bad, so now you're kind of working for them like you're, well, it's, listen, I think the truth is, Medicine, there's good medicine out there. You know, I'm a U.S. medical school graduate. I believe in Western medicine. I've seen it, you know, keep preterm babies alive that grow up and live amazing lives. I've seen it save a lot of people's lives, open heart surgeries. Modern medicine is an amazing tool. I just, I feel that it has to be used correctly. And so there's nothing inherently bad about the pharmaceutical industry. And with my current position, what is interesting for me now is I thought I had kind of left the cannabis industry, you know, moved on to, to um, a different area of work. But the truth is, I am seeing now a lot of the big pharmaceutical companies, and these are name, household names that you would recognize. I can't divulge because of 
through confidentiality agreements, but they are now investing in a lot of their products. You know, just like uh, Mr. Mayer mentioned about FDA deal lex and, and its first approval by the FDA, a lot of other pharmaceutical companies are now making medications that target this endocannabinoid system, and that's the kind of work that I'm seeing trickle in um, with my regular day job. So it's really interesting. This research and those numbers are only gonna get greater. So, I'm not sure if we're stuck for John, so that's not important. There's two types. Uh, the endocannabinoid system is a series of receptors located throughout your body. And there's only really two types of receptors that we've isolated so far, to my knowledge. And then there may be new developments since I gave this talk. CB1 receptors are located in your brain, and CB2 receptors are located throughout your body. And so, uh, that, that, what I've broken down here is kind of where you see the uh, differences in its um, presentation. And it's also, in the next slide I believe, is why we see different effects and how you hear about people with a wide array of different symptoms all claiming that cannabis can help them. You got someone with migraines up here and then you got someone with Crohn's disease or celiac down here and yet cannabis seems to help with both. This, this is the reason why the receptors that THC and CBD work on are located in all the areas that these uh, patients are having their symptoms in. That's, that's what the receptors look like. So looking in the brain, um, this is a technical chart, but you know, th there's a lot of places where uh, you see these receptors are present, you know, and, and then so up here, the cerebral cortex, as it's listed, it is uh, involved with higher cognitive function. Now, if it's if it is triggered by THC, then that's where you hear about people that have you know short-term memory issues and then problems remembering. Cerebellum over here is involved with movement, so you can see that some certain people, you know, all the all the things that you have come to know that people when they're high will experience. That's the reason why. But there's one thing, there's one area of the brain that doesn't have the uh, cannabinoid receptor, and it's the most important part. And the, and, and the one part of the brain that doesn't have the receptor is the part of the brain that controls your breathing. And that's important because opioid receptors are located in that area, and that's why opioids are such a more, in my opinion, a more dangerous drug compared to cannabis. That's the reason Prince unfortunately passed away. That's the reason our fellow Americans who are dying from overdosing on opioids are passing away because that area of the brain is triggered by opioids and what happens is it shuts it down. It keeps folks who have opioids in their system to that level from being able to breathe, and that was one of the parts of my job as an anesthesiologist, is to keep that from happening. So, as you can see here, in this case, no matter how much THC, or how much CBD, especially CBD, but no matter how much THC is in your body, there's no place for it to bind you in your brain to keep you from breathing. And that is why, to this day, we have zero cases of anyone overdosing and having a fatal outcome too much THC in their system. This is just a technical, another technical chart looking at the chemicals um, that are involved and the different receptors and transmitters. These two right here, anandamide and 2-AG, those are what we call your endogenous cannabinoids. That's what CBD triggers to be released in your body. And that's what goes on to work. And that's also one of the reasons why CBD doesn't make you feel high, because you're not walking around high right now, you know. So, so going back to that endocannabinoid system and its whole purpose, this is happening in your, you know, during your day, whether you know it or not. You know, your body is sensing these oxidative stresses, it's sensing these, these inflammation and these, these things that it's trying to maintain and control. So it releases these two, the anandamide and 2-AG, to balance and maintain the homeostasis in your body, but it doesn't trigger the areas of your brain that would necessarily make you feel high. THC binds to the same receptors over here, just like these guys do, but they bind to it much stronger, so that's the reason that THC uh, seems to take over the system, it binds the areas of your brain that does trigger a mental effect. So that's the, the, the main difference between the 
too. Um, that's just how they look. So that's a that's a picture of anandamide that everyone has in their body and it's being released. And that's the that's how THC looks. So you can see that they're 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 they, they look the same, that's how they're able to divide in the same place. They're a narrow transmitter, they they will serve as just signaling pathways. Um, you find the CD1, CD2 receptor, just talk about anandamide, 2AG, that's its name. Okay, and then CBD. So it's non-psychoactive component. It doesn't bind to CB1 or CB2 as much. And in fact, you know, you, I'm sure everyone here has heard stories, you know, not good experiences with folks that indulge with edibles, right? You know, uh, edibles are a different beast. We'll talk about that a little bit here. But, uh, the, you know, the folks that will have too much and start to have uh, very, you know, unwanted mental experiences, uh, you know, the, the actual antidote to help them kind of come back and, and relax and not have such an intense experience is actually CBD, based on what I just said, because CBD will actually be released and release the 2-AG, the anandamide, to compete with the THC. Uh, so that's actually the, the best way uh, to come back from one of those uh, experiences. This is more technical terms for it. Um, I don't think any of this is really relevant here. It's just some more technical issues. But what, what, what in, in addition to, to what I mentioned about homeostasis and, and, and uh, reducing inflammation when there's too much, we actually have very solid medical evidence at this point that THC or triggering the endocannabinoid system is, has very strong neuroprotective properties. And what that means is for conditions, if I'm not gonna talk, oh, here we go, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, these are all neurological diseases where either the person's own immune system goes on the offensive and attacks the person's own nervous system, or just the, the, the nerves are degrading over time and Parkinson's, the substantial nigra stops producing dopamine, so even though we're not sure why this happens, even though we're still not sure why this occurs, what we have found is that the endocannabinoid system slows that process down. It actually protects your nerves. And the strongest evidence that we have for that is in the patients with MS, with multiple sclerosis down here. Multiple sclerosis, if you know, uh, has different stages. It affects people over a, a spectrum. Some have it more serious than others. But no matter what spectrum you're at, no matter what stage you're at, no matter how severe your symptoms are, everyone who starts cannabinoid therapy benefits. And a lot of their symptoms are either the process is slowed, and in some cases, we do actually see a reversal of the Neuro damage. In fact, I, I put this in there because it's very rare to see something like this. This is a, a patent that the United States government has on the antioxidants and neuroprotective properties of cannabis. I say it's rare because patents are usually issued to a synthetic component. That's how the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry is able to have their you know, their, 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 their special protected brand name product for a while before generics get made because it's protected by the patent. And usually that has to be something that is synthesized in a lab. It's very rare for patents to be issued for a naturally occurring plant. So that's why you don't see uh, herbs and supplements that have this. And so uh, I think we're getting towards the end of my time. Um, but I just wanted to say here too that the activation of the endo endocannabinoid system has different effects depending on where it is working in your body. I think we talked about that a little earlier. I think what we may want to focus on is, is this right here, the site of injury, and the fact that it reduces inflammation. Uh, I think that's the mainstay of people with arthritis. Arthritis is simply inflammation of your joints. And if, if, if you or anyone you know suffer from arthritis, it's a very painful condition and it's very frustrating because depending on if the weather is cold or depending on how active you are, it's gonna flare up and then you're relegated to taking all the painkillers that are available to you. But what is nice about 
leveraging the endocannabinoid system and cannabinoid therapy in general is that not only would it give you acute relief for the pain and the inflammation that you're experiencing at that moment in time, but because of its, 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 its effects in reducing inflammation overall and improving your homeostasis, your balance, you tend to have to reach for it less often. So not only is it uh, 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 treating it acutely, but it's almost prophylactic as well. Um, immune, uh, let's see, the, the digestive system down here is something I mentioned earlier too. Crohn's disease, celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, these are all diseases of inflammation of the gut. And so this is why we also see so many of my own patients that have these uh, GI symptoms improve so much once they adopt uh, uh, cannabinoid therapy. It's, it's been frustrating because the pharmaceutical options uh, come with their own side effects. Side effects here, uh, if, if you have them, if you're using THC, which is stimulate your appetite, which for some of these patients is, is a welcome effect. So there's been a growing interest and data coming out in terms of cancer and how uh, cannabis actually has a role in this. So these are all the different types of, of, of cancers out there that, that uh, have been shown to be affected and, and affected in the sense that it keeps it from progressing uh, and has been shown to, in some cases, stop its, its, its spread um, through, through the endocannabinoid system. So the, 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 the point of this slide is that it's not a cure-all, but these are different cancers that arise from different cell lines. And that's, that's one of the hardest things about treating cancer or curing cancer. And uh, I think I read an article recently about a team um, in Israel that found like a cure-all for all cancer, which, which would be amazing if that's the case. But the hard part about curing cancer is it comes from different cells. So there's no one-size-fits-all treatment. But what is interesting in this case is we are seeing that it is the can the cannabis and cannabinoid therapy is affecting such a wide array of different cancer lines that there is a lot of potential here. What we know at this point, and what I can tell you definitively, is that it's been shown to prevent the angiogenesis uh, for a tumor, which is for a tumor to grow in size, what it does is siphons off blood supply from the rest of your body. It does so by creating its own blood vessels. Cannabis or THC, the endocannabinoid system, does seem to prevent that from happening. I think, oh, so, so, so that's what I just said, point number two, and, it, and CB1 activation, so triggering that, that receptor does seem to cause apoptosis or the destruction or the self-destruction of the cancer cells. Uh, and it can keep the cancer cells from sticking to other areas, so that's how it spreads. It gets into your blood and then it kind of migrates to other areas, it sticks to those areas and then it starts growing in those areas and it does, the CB1 receptor activation does seem to prevent that. And it does, it does all this without killing your normal healthy cells. So the chemotherapy patients, the radiation patients, all the side effects that you see from, uh, from, from folks having to undergo that, 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 that difficult treatment, um, this doesn't cause some of those other effects. But it's not without its, you know, it's not without its drawbacks. There, there is something that we're starting to see called cannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead, I'm sorry. That's why I mentioned that it's been a while. Um, that even though the CBD has such a wide um, spectrum of effects, the, it, the theory goes is that these conditions that I've listed here may be the result of individuals not having a very robust endocannabinoid system. Because if you remember what I was telling you earlier about how CBD works, it works by triggering your body to release its own version of THC. Remember the 2-AG, the anandamide, the theory goes is that for these individuals that are suffering from these conditions, it's possible that their endocannabinoid system isn't working well, or they just may be deficient in the 2-AGs, the anandamides. And so PMS, you know, every month, a woman of reproductive potential goes through a very wide you know, swings of her hormones. Some of those exaggerated uh, levels are what leads to the PMS symptoms. And so the endocannabinoid system through homeostasis reduces those to the expected levels, thereby those, those, those 
peaks and valleys are eliminated and she doesn't have her migraines, her, her cramping pain is reduced, and so on and so forth. Fibromyalgia is a very difficult pain condition to treat. So it's something that chronic pain doctors struggle with all the time. Um, migraines, there are theories about certain, why certain people have migraines. This reason, combined with this neuroprotective effects we talked about, are all reasons why these patients improve with this. And of course, irritable bowel syndrome, anorexia, and everything else that we talked about too. So, in summary, there's only one goal that it has, this endocannabinoid system, and it's not to make you, you know, high. Um, it's, it's to maintain balance in your body. There are receptors located throughout your body that have varying effects, but all with one purpose. And we in our own bodies have a version of THC that is being produced, secreted, and worked on to help us stay healthy and balanced. Um, activation of these receptor receptors, either through our own body's version of THC or exogenous external THC, leads to the neuroprotection that I talked about, reducing inflammation, and also dilating your blood vessels. So people with uh, high blood pressure do see a bit of improvement uh, with the blood pressure as well. Some of that is also stress, which, which, which this helps with too. So the theory is, is that if you are deficient in cannabinoids, it's possible that you're a, you're a patient suffering with PMS, fibromyalgia, and the other things I listed above. So that's, that's it. That's all I want to talk about here. Um, the rest would go well over my time, uh, so I'll turn it over back to the, the mayor.